you're just tuning in, I got a little, I got a little jingle here. Um, we are, we're in a series, Ugly Christmas Sweater. Probably not a surprise if you're just tuning in for the first time. You may have figured that out already. Uh, I got a text message already this morning. I don't usually check my phone during uh, service, but uh, I got a text message that said, best sweater yet. Um, I can't believe the seriousness of the crowd this morning. I don't know to be impressed by that or to maybe to have uh, uh, give you an eye test or something. But um, Matt, if you could if you could join us or if you could show off to those that are online, maybe you thought it was so. Maybe you thought it looked so real that I mean I don't even I don't even I don't even understand what's happening. Look at this. Look at this sweater. I mean, <laughs> we thought this was his real chest. <laughs> manly, manly, right? Like that's, we didn't actually do a competition, but I think if we did, and, and I was warned, like I knew this was coming, so uh, I, can't, I can't top that. Anybody have one they'd like to show off? Who's, who's, because some Christmas sweaters are cute and nice, and so I don't want to accuse you of having an ugly, all right, Lacey's got some, that's, see, that's not, that's the, that's not nearly as ugly as mine. <laughs> um, you know, Matt's really makes uh, every other ugly sweater look look beautiful and lovely. Um, I don't mean to make you stay up here. Thanks, man. Uh, anybody else want to show off your? Anybody else want to show show off? Jeff's got a, a Christmas uh, an ugly T-shirt. Uh, Je- Jenny, come on, that's a, like it's. Like, I like the color scheme, but that you can't be serious with the <laughs> sauce watch. I don't know if they're seeing that online. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff's got his thing going on. What's, what's going on? I don't know if they can see that or not. Beautiful. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, we got some folks in the back that are supporting it. Really? Jasmine has, I don't know. Uh, Easton, what? I see antlers back there. What's going on? Is that a serious one or is that an ugly one? It's, oh, that, is it attractive? I can't tell. I see antlers. Oh, it looks nice. All right. I can't, I can't tell if it's ugly or attractive. What does that tell you? Um, no, he's sitting behind Pete. I can't see, I can't see the, the sweater. So, uh, so that's a legit one. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. For... Uh, Oh, we got another one coming in. All right, so we have another ugly sweater. I don't know how close you could see these online, but oh, I don't. I don't know if you can still see after seeing some of these sweaters. I don't know. All right, somebody, somebody is going to make an entrance here. Oh, Elizabeth. All right, that's not ugly. Come on. But it's uh, it's flashy. It is flashy. I don't think that qualifies as a, I mean, mine, mine's not too bad. Mine's kind of mine's pretty, but that's because it's a woman's sweater. Um, I only have so many funds to invest in stupid sweaters. Um, so uh, we'll, see how long this, we'll see how long this one lasts. What a ridiculous looking thing. All right, so we are, we're having fun in our series, Ugly Christmas Sweater, and we're talking about, obviously, not just ugly Christmas sweaters, although there's so much to talk about. Um, we, uh, we are discussing ugly attitudes that often accompany uh, our sweaters and this time of year, and we talked about ugly thoughts, and we talked about ugly words. This week is going to be, uh, is fun the word? I don't know if fun, fun might not be the word. Interesting, maybe. Uh, because we're going to address, oh, you, you probably saw if you're watching, wait, did we do the video? Oh, we better do the video. Okay, let's do the video. <laughs> then they'll know. I got carried away. I got so excited. Now you'll know.
Week three, ugly motives. All right, so I think that's interesting. So we talked about uh, thoughts and ugly words. First of all, is this distracting? Do I need to get rid of this? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I knew there would be the no. All right, I'll try it. I'll see what I can do. It's, it's, distracti- it's distracting me, all right? I look down and I'm blinded. Um, so what I think is interesting about this week is ugly motives. And a, a really interesting thing to me, I guess interesting may, might be the right word, uh, about motives is that that's not something that we really have to change. And, and uh, like us and the Lord are the only ones who might know what our motives are. So if you're, if you're not really serious about this Christianity thing and becoming more like Christ and, and if, you know, you just, you just want to make it to heaven and, you, you know, I just... I just want eternal life, and don't bother me with other stuff. I mean, maybe you're not going to, I'm not really sure that's the Christian attitude, um, but your, at, your motives are something that you can hide. And your motives are something, this morning, if, you, if you're not interested in becoming more like Jesus and fulfilling God's will for your life and, and living a life that's pleasing to the Lord, then you can just tune me out right now. Because how many people really are going to discover what your motives are? But what is cool about this, this week's message is that if we, if we embrace this idea, if we take it upon ourselves to address and to look inside and deal with our motives, that's, that's serious. That's, that's hardcore. That is, that is real Christianity, right? Because this is something that we could easily hide. And people, I mean, there might be hints and there might be some, some overtones in the way we do things. But we can do good things with bad motives, right? I mean, we can, we can do uh, uh, generous things, uh, kind things um, with, with, with bad motives. And so uh, I want to encourage you to not tune me out, but to actually uh, take this to heart. And what if... We were a people that began to, uh, not began because we're not, many of us are not beginning this process, but what if we were people that looked inside and examined our motives before we did, um, before we did whatever. So each of our decisions uh, are based on different motivations. We have different motivations and those might be good, or those might be bad. So it's important for us to pay attention to those kinds of things. I don't know how many sermons are preached on your motives. I don't know when the last time you were challenged or someone invited you to investigate or to look inside as to what's going on inside of you, but I'm, I'm glad that this can be our reminder this morning that we, uh, that we need to look inside and we need to uh, examine ourselves to see what our motives really are. Obviously, we're tempted by our sinful nature to, uh, you know, I can make myself look better, not by wearing this, but I can make myself look better by doing some things that, that look good and make me look like a, a kind person, and that will make me look awesome, right? <laughs> um, I can do things um, that, that look good, and I, I can still have selfish motivations behind them. So Jesus was interested in our motivations in his earthly ministry. This is something that, that he cared about. He addressed this uh, a number of times. We're, we want to take a look at Matthew 6 before I read before I read there, um, you know, there's, there's uh, other places in Scripture where Jesus addresses not only, um, you know, you might not commit this outward sin. You might not murder somebody. You might not commit adultery. You might not do fill in the blank. But what was different, what's one of the things that was different between the Old Testament and the New Testament was the Old Testament was just try, trying to get you to behave a little bit, Right? Um, we know Paul said the Old Testament, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the law and the rules were to demonstrate to us that we couldn't, uh, oh, that we weren't sinless and that, that we were fallen, sinful creatures. That's part, that's part of the reason. Uh, uh, but obviously there's other reasons as well. Not murdering people is, is a good idea, right? It's a great, I'm a big fan of the not murdering Right, I'm a big, big, big fan of that. That's if you get if society is going to advance and we're going to move along, and you're going to if you're trying to build a nation, you know, cutting back on the murder is a great way to do that. Okay, um, so I'm a, I'm a bit I'm a big fan of that. But in in one sense, the Old Testament was really just like try to just hold on, try to just not mess up too bad. And when Jesus showed up. He was different than everyone that had come before him in a number of ways. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Um, 
but he was interested in what was going on on the inside. Like, it wasn't good enough just to not murder somebody. You ever, you ever talk to somebody about, about uh, share the gospel or talk to them about Jesus, and they're like, well, I'm a pretty good person. I've never murdered anyone. Well, congratulations. You're like, you're like most people. Most people that I know? Maybe all people. I hope it's all people that I know. Most people that I know are all I haven't murdered, so congratulations. But that wouldn't have satisfied Jesus, would it? He wants to know what's going on in your heart. Like, it's fine if you can just not do the obvious bad stuff that everyone sees and going to get you thrown into prison. That's wonderful. But Jesus wanted us to know, or Jesus asked the kind of questions like, what's going on in your heart? What's going on inside of you? Like, maybe you didn't commit adultery, but if you want to, and there's, if there's all kinds of crazy lust going on inside of you, then we should probably deal with that. And thank God in the New Testament, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus, we can actually overcome that stuff on the inside and become different from the inside out. So uh, Jesus addresses um, inward things, and he, takes, he has taken great interest in that in the scriptures uh, and continues to to this day. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look at verse, verse 1. Jesus said, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Very interesting. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. I looked that up, and uh, like, did they actually announce with trumpets? And it looks like Jesus was uh, uh, speaking figuratively, like, don't make a big deal about it. I thought, did the Pharisees actually announce it with trumpets? Hey, everybody, I'm, I'm giving to the needy. Uh, they, they didn't do that. There's no, there's no example in scripture or history about uh, trumpets actually being blown. But, but Jesus is making the point, like, don't make a big deal about it. Blow the trumpets. Uh, I sort of like his attitude, like, don't blow the trumpets. Oh, I'm a giver. Everybody look at me. Uh, Jesus probably didn't say it that way, but that's probably, that's probably the attitude. Probably not. That's, but that was the attitude, right? Like, don't make a big deal about it. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Obviously, figurative language there. Uh, verse four, so that your giving may be in secret. The, the idea there is give in a way that maybe even you don't remember what you gave or, or that you did this, this thing that, that maybe you, you don't even remember what it is. Uh, or, or uh, uh, you know, how many times you served and how many times you were gracious and how many times you were kind, right? Um, don't, don't keep track of that stuff. Um, so that your giving may be in secret, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So that's interesting. Jesus, if you, if you do it without seeking the accolades of other human beings, then we receive the accolades of God. And he says that, that the Lord will reward us for that, right? So verse five. <laughs> And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. All right, and verse 16, we'll jump ahead to verse 16. There's the same idea is repeated here in the next few uh, verses. He goes on to say, but when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. So you get the idea here. Again, Jesus is interested in what is going on on the inside and says that if we, if we do these things to be noticed by other people, then there's no reward for us um, from the Lord himself. So that, the Lord has great interest in that. Um, the, uh, and, the, and the problem is not with the actions themselves, right? So giving to the needy is a good thing. Uh, praying is a good thing. Fasting, also a good thing. But if you only do it, so his primary audience here, I mean, he had a, a, there was a large group. But the Pharisees were people that were particularly interested. Um, we pick on the Pharisees a lot because they deserved it. Uh, they deserve it. And Jesus picked on them a lot. And they loved to look spiritual. They, they liked, they li I mean, it's, it's a little different in our day, but in their day, 
Um, you got crazy amounts of respect if you were like super spiritual. That's just the time in which they lived. And, and uh, I don't know if you get mad respect for being spiritual in the day and age that we live in. Maybe, maybe some, depends on who your audience is. But in that day and age, it was a big deal. So the Pharisees made a big deal about, hey, everybody, look what I'm giving. Look how good of a person I am. Um, look, I want you to, you know, I could easily pray at home. Uh, I didn't, but I could easily pray at home. But I want to come out in public. And, and pray in areas and places where people notice me praying. Because isn't that what prayer is really all about? Being noticed by other people, <laughs> right? And they're fasting, and Jesus is like, look, man, just don't, don't look like you're miserable when you're fasting. Now, this question has come up before. You know, you invite somebody to lunch, and they're fasting, and they're like, Ugh, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm not supposed to tell them that I'm fasting, but I don't, I, I don't want to lie either. I don't think Jesus said you can't tell someone that you're fasting, um, the idea here is that is that you don't make a big show of it and make a big deal about it and uh, act like, you know, you're a martyr because because you're fasting. So, I mean, if uh, if you're fasting and somebody invites you to lunch or whatever, you can say, ah, you know what, uh, I'm fasting. It's okay. No, no sin committed. But you get the idea what these Pharisees were all about. So rather than seeking a genuine spiritual life and a genuine relationship with God, they were, just, uh, they were just interested in people thinking they were spiritual. That's messed up, man. That is really messed up. We have some of those same inclinations, I think. I think so. Uh, so Jesus wasn't um, condemning the actions themselves, but the motives behind them. So he's interested in that, that kind of thing. Um, ugly motives can, can hurt our witness. In, in the earth, it can hurt our testimony before others if we try to receive acclaim and, uh, and uh, praise from men. So, so I asked my wife, I said, um, hey, I need an example of some time where my motives were, uh, were, you know, like my motives were bad, but I did something, you know, to look, to look good. And uh, she thought about it for a little while and thought about it for a little while. And she came up with a couple bad examples. But uh, <laughs> the longer, right, the longer she struggled, I said, you know, I'm starting to feel pretty good about myself right about now. Uh, actually, the things that she, lit, that she named, I said, I'm not going to say that in church. I'm not going to, right? Uh, but we all do that. We have times where, uh, you know, th maybe Christmas is an appropriate time to bring this up. Come on, wives, are you with me here this morning? Um, have you ever, you don't have to shout it out. You don't have to say amen. You know, there are times we like you to say amen. This time I'm actually encouraging you to not, like, keep it to yourself. Uh, but maybe you can think of a Christmas where you received a gift and you thought to yourself, this is really for, you know, my husband bought this. This is really for him. <laughs> right? Like, it's not, it's not, it's not for me. Um, and so we all uh, 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 have moments, moment, I mean like you, not we, but we, you have moments like that when your motives are, uh, are not so good. Isn't it, don't you find it interesting that the Lord cares about what your motives are? Like maybe you're even doing the good thing, but he wants your heart to be in a right place too. That's better for you, it's better for your spiritual growth. It's better for the witness that we are uh, giving and representing before the world. So since I didn't want to tell you any of my horrible, uh, bad motivation stories or the lack thereof. <laughs> see, I only say that to make myself look better. Right? See, see what I did there? Uh, but but <laughs> I had this, uh, I did have this one example of, of somebody that I, I thought of. Uh, not somebody from church, uh, but, but somebody uh, that was a part of our family's uh, li lives for um, a period of time. And as I was kind of going over this sermon and kind of trying to think of, think of examples, I was trying to think of stuff for me, but I, I just couldn't think of it. It's not because I'm, I don't have, ever have bad moments, it's just because I can't remember stuff. I want to put that stuff behind you, right? Um, <laughs> but there was an individual, and I thought of this, I thought of this person and something that this person did. And I thought, you know, there's no reason to, to bring that. It's not somebody that you would know, um, but there's no reason to bring that up. And then, yesterday, one of my children quoted this individual. So 
it's stuck. Um, I see some in the room like going, what, what is he going to bring up? So there was an individual that, I, I don't remember what the thing was, but it was, they did something nice or generous or, or something like that. Alex is smiling. She already knows. Do you already know? You know where I'm going with this. Um, they did something. And, and so we go, oh, th thank you. That was nice. Or, that was wonderful. Whatever. And he sort of kept going <laughs> about this thing. And uh, at one point said, you know, I'm a really good person. <laughs> Almost that way, too. Like, I'm a... I'm a real, so you don't look at, like, if, if you're not getting this, if I'm not making sense, if I'm not getting through, let me help you. When you do something nice, don't immediately after say, ah, I am such a good person. I mean, I'm amazing. I'm really amazing, right? Like, and so, so, but think about that. So he had the audacity to speak those words out. And sometimes when we're feeling sassy and it applies and it's done in a humorous way, but someone will say in our house, you know what, I'm really a good person. So it's stuck. Now think about that. Think about that for a minute. The good thing, I don't remember what that was. I don't remember what the good, I honestly don't remember what, maybe I should ask the family later, but uh, I don't remember what that was. I remember the attitude that overflowed and spilled out. Uh, the, I'm, I'm such a good person. Un unbelievable, really. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, elaborating a little bit. I'm embellishing it some. Uh, but that was sort of the attitude. And it came through loud and clear. That did not help the relationship. That probably harmed uh, the relationship. So uh, our motives are, are important, and they, and they matter. Um, so, so Jesus tells us that there is a greater reward that we can receive if we're not seeking the accolades of other human beings. Um, our humility is important to the Lord as well. So let's take a look at, it's, uh, it's Advent, it's the Christmas season, so let's take a look at some, some Christmas scripture here. I think we might hear this later again today. Um, but, but think about the way that Jesus entered into the world. He entered in with... Uh, such great humility. Luke chapter 2, uh, Luke tells us that in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. I was going to say this is the first census that took place while Quirinius, I could say it before church, but you can't say it when it's actually time to preach it, Quirinius uh, was governor of Syria. Verse 3, and everyone went to his town to register. All right. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. He was royalty. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. He wrapped himself, uh, sorry, she wrapped him. He might have been, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe he could have. He couldn't. He couldn't, he couldn't do that. I, I hate to mention this again, but um, I, so many Christmases I talk about that. You ever see the old pictures of Mary and Jesus? Like baby Jesus. Um, and he like always has this wise look on his face like, get me i'm jesus you know um like he has like the baby face but there's something that's like i got you you know like like this great wisdom and and that's not how that's not how that was at all when jesus is god um was god is god remains god 100 percent god 100 percent man but when he came as a baby he was a baby so that's why i say he could not have wrapped himself in his clothes. I just misread the scripture. Um, he, but, but it is interesting, like, because we, we, I joked about that for a second, but he came as a baby. I mean, he was a le legitimate baby. He wasn't pretending to be a baby. He wasn't pretending to be uh, um, a newborn and frail and weak in his humanity. And, well, I should say his divinity, he laid down some of that power. So uh, the, the Old Testament tells us that he grew in wisdom and knowledge and might. So he didn't just show up on day one and know it all. 
I think that's a fascinating reality. Like, that, that's, that's amazing to me. I wonder what it was like when Jesus was reading through the scriptures and he realized, like, that's, that's talking about me. It probably didn't dawn on him all at once. Like, there was probably, uh, he had a good prayer life, the Lord was speaking with him, and, and so it probably didn't hit him at, like, you know, 12. Guess what? You're the Messiah, right? But, but as a baby, he was a baby. So she, being Mary, wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So Jesus' arrival, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, is the incarnation and Jesus becoming man. And not just a man like a descending from heaven, uh, a man uh, a descending in splendor and glory, but as a baby uh, born in a stall with, with smelly animals, right? Like even his arrival uh, speaks to humility. And while he's certainly worthy of praise and glory, um, that's not the way that he came into the world. Now, one of the, one of the, the big uh, cults um, teaches that, that Jesus showed up uh, in, in the Americas as well. You know, like it's a big, it's, there's a body of water between Bethlehem and here. And Jesus showed up here. But what's, what strikes me as odd when I, when I read it in their scriptures is that he came as a king in power and glory with thunder and lightning and earthquakes. And like, well, that seems a little different than the way he showed up in the other, in the other, in the other part of the world, right? Um, there's obviously a glaring difference there because that wasn't the way that, that he intended to, to make his entrance into the human race. It was in humility, in a manger, in a stable, with the animals around and all the, all the smell. Um, and he deserved the spotlight, but he came with great humility. So I couldn't help but notice. Now, DJ, didn't, he didn't stand up for our ugly sweater. Now, is that a sweater or a sweatshirt? What are we talking it's about? A sweatshirt. It's a sweatshirt, so it doesn't, it doesn't count. All right. I thought it was a sweater. And I thought, how do you make a Christmas sweater that actually says Notre Dame on it? And... Uh, <laughs> And I noticed, <laughs> I, we have a few, there's a few. Um, there's, there's, we got any Notre Dame fans in the place here? All right, there's a few, all right. I, I think even, even I, and so, like some people, just the way you raise your hand, I can tell how much you love them, right? So even I talked about Michigan beating Ohio State, which surprised everyone. But there is a powerful uh, story that illustrates uh, our motivation um, from the likes of college football. In fact, it comes from Notre Dame. And the star uh, that you may be familiar with, George Gipp. He could do everything George Gipp could. He could run, he could pass, he could punt um, with unparalleled skill. The 1920 season established Gipp as a legit football star, right? But on December 14th, 1920, uh, young George Gipp died of pneumonia. But thanks to college football stories and former president Ronald Reagan, who played him in a movie, uh, the story of George Gipp lives on. And on November 10th, 1928, uh, Notre Dame and Army were tied at halftime in a struggle for victory. Notre Dame coach Newt Rockney himself also a legend um, recalled how Gip, uh, in his final moments or his final uh, uh, time before his death at Gip's bedside, um, just a few years before, had told Newt Rockney this story. And Rockney recited how Gip feebly said, Sometimes, Rock, when the team is up against it and when, they, uh, and when things are going wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, Tell them to go in there with all they've got and win just one. You know this even if you're not a Notre Dame fan. And win just one for the Gipper. And that's exactly what they did. Notre Dame was motivated uh, to honor Gip. It inspired them to fight and to win. Go in there and win just one for the Gipper. His memory, 
and who he was and to honor him. And he was their motivation to fight a little harder, to try a little more, to strain and give it that extra effort that led them to victory. And I think that's a beautiful example of how, as believers, we should live for Christ. That, that he is our motivation to work harder. He is our motivation to love more and to serve more. And like when we feel like we're at the end and we can do no more, or when we just have a bad attitude, that we should think and remember the example uh, that New Rockney gave about Gip, George Gip, and think, well, if, if George Gip can motivate the Notre Dame football team in such a way, then how might Jesus motivate me to live my life sacrificially for others? Colossians 3.23 uh, illustrates this well. Paul says that whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Right? We're not working to impress others. We're working to please the Lord. Um, now, well, all right, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Uh, it's just funny. Um, all right. Um, I jumped ahead and I just want to say, it. all right, so we're having fun with ugly Christmas sweaters. Uh, it's just, it's, it must be time now. Um, but if we're, I mean, and it's a good time and I, I hope I don't scare you and you, you don't wear your ugly Christmas sweater. Is anybody holding back like you haven't worn it? Like you're just waiting for the final Sunday? But when you show up at the party and you've got your ugly, hideous Christmas sweater on, what's What's really the point? <clears throat> to get attention. That were, that were, I mean, that, what? And, and it's all good. It's all fun. We're not judging you for your ugly. We'd be like, man, preacher, what are you going to do? You're going to throw me under the bus? I only bought this dumb sweater because of this series. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that. That's all in good fun. But, but that's kind of like uh, it, it, we can't escape the reality that, that kind of the point is to draw attention to ourselves. And as believers... As believers, it's not about drawing attention to ourselves. It's about drawing attention and getting praise for Christ, right? It's about Jesus getting the attention. Um, Philippians uh, chapter 2, um, this, this verse precedes a passage that is the theologians call the kenosis passage or the kenosis of Christ. And that's uh, a Greek word which means to empty. And so I referred to this a little bit earlier, that Jesus in the incarnation, when he became man, he never ceased to be God, but he emptied himself of the rights and privileges and, and, and maybe even the, the power that, that came with it. You say, well, how did he do the things that he did? I believe he did the things that he did as a man obedient to God's Holy Spirit. As God, his Father, led him and as the Spirit led him, that's why Jesus did the things that he did. But the kenosis passage in Philippians illustrates for us that Jesus emptied himself of, of some of, he didn't, he didn't lose his, his character or, 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 or anything like that, but he emptied himself and humbled himself. And the passage is there to teach us that, look, if Jesus can humble himself, if eternal God can become man and come here and minister to man, then we can be humble ourselves, right? If Jesus can be humble, then, then maybe I ought to give it a shot, right? So uh, prior to this kenosis passage, or just uh, uh, yeah, right before this passage, Paul writes this. This is a powerful verse. Think about this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Like, you needed to come to church to hear that. Um, I don't know the last time that you were challenged or someone reminded you or someone suggested that you know what you ought to do is you ought to value other people more than yourself. Like, that's, that's one of the things that, that uh, it's, it's something that the scriptures tell us. But uh, I love that about church. Like, whenever I come across a, a verse like that, I'm like, yeah, they haven't heard that this week. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, something that I need to be reminded of. And I love that scripture, and it's good to be reminded of that. But think about Paul and the audacity to write that we should 
consider or value others. In humility, value others above ourselves. And then he goes into this passage. I'd encourage, I'd encourage you to read it. It's appropriate for Christmas time about the kenosis of Christ. So evidently there was competition going on in, in the early church. That could have destroyed the church. So even in the body of Christ, there's competition. There's jockeying for position. There's wanting to get recognized and wanting to be seen. So when we're motivated to receive honor and, and get glory for ourselves, then Jesus doesn't get the proper, he doesn't get the proper glory, the proper praise. So I, I want to encourage you and dare I say, challenge you with something this week. I want to I wanna challenge you to choose a person, could be maybe a family, I don't know, to choose a person and to do something kind or generous, loving, giving uh, for this person. And the purpose is only to honor Jesus and to bless the person, right? But to honor Jesus um, and, to, and to honor them. Uh, maybe it would be uh, an anonymous letter of encouragement. Maybe it's an anonymous gift or a gift card. Maybe it's uh, uh, something left on the doorstep. Um, but, but anonymous, so nobody knows that, that you're responsible for doing it. Um, and that way, God gets the glory, the person gets blessed, and you get no, like you get nothing in earthly recognition as a result of it. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> so, okay, you know, our church is so spiritual, like seriously. Like I said at Smarty Pants, like I said at Smarty Pants, like, really, I'm a human, and it doesn't sound that much. That doesn't sound, it doesn't sound that fun. Uh, but our church is so spiritual, like legit, not Pharisee spiritual, but like legit <laughs> spiritual. People are like, yeah, it does sound fun. <laughs> Good for you. This is, hey, this is a great place, man. Yeah. Like, like this is, that, that's pretty great. So I want to encourage you to think of a way, think of a person that you can bless somebody, do something for somebody, and make sure the key is you get no credit for it whatsoever. Nobody can know about it. That's good training for giving God the glory in all we do, right? And, and it, 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 helps, it helps us mature as believers. It strengthens us. Uh, it pleases the Lord. And it helps us to put our own motives on, on the back burner and, and put Jesus first. All right? So I would encourage you to, to do that. And, uh, and may that be something that, that the Lord uses to make us more like him that causes us to grow up and be become and mature as believers. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just uh, pray right now that by your spirit you would uh, put somebody on our hearts and minds. Um, you know, I, I'm confident everyone won't do this, but I know for me, uh, the problem would be like I would overthink it and like, well, who's the person and what's the thing I should do? Well, I just pray that by your spirit you would just drop that individual or that family uh, into our hearts and minds, that that wouldn't be something that, that we would have to wrestle with and then come Thursday and like, oh man, I was going to try to do that, try to do that thing. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would, you would give us somebody that we could, that we could be a blessing to and, uh, and do that anonymously. And maybe even uh, how we should do it. Like, like maybe the ladies already know, but the guys are like, all right, but now what do I do, right? Um, I think we struggle with that stuff, maybe more. So, Lord, that's why we need you. That's why we need your spirit. Lord, we just invite you to drop into our hearts and minds an individual, maybe a family, um, and what we want to do for them and how we're going to do it in a way that we receive no credit. I don't, I, I'm, maybe I need to check my heart. I don't know, but I do think that that, that feels nice. Maybe it feels nice because I've got wrong motives and I think maybe I'm a, like, a, I'm a pretty good person. I am a really good person. I mean, maybe that's the reason it feels, but I, I, I think it does feel nice. Maybe I, I got to check myself, I guess. Um, but the idea here in the scriptures show us, and Jesus said that when we do things like that and we don't do it for human recognition, that the Lord sees it and and he rewards and blesses us 
as a result of that. Lord, I just pray that each and every one in this place and those that are listening online would, would take upon themselves this responsibility of examine, examining what's going on in their hearts and minds. This would be easy for us to just neglect and just to, to just move right past it. Like people, people would be hard pressed to know what's going on in my heart of hearts so I can get away with having horrible motives. Um, but Lord, I want to mature as a believer. I want to be, I want to be a better person. I, I want to get rid of self-interest, selfish self-interest. I mean, we need to take care of ourselves. Don't anybody, you know, we won't want to take it to extremes, but um, selfish self-interest. And learn how to put others first. And as Paul said, value others above ourselves. It's remarkable. Lord, we thank you. Uh, we need uh, the example of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to make it happen. So, Lord, we invite you to do a work in us. And I just, ima- I just am imagining the folks that will be blessed as a result of, of those at Lakeside and those watching online of taking it upon themselves to do something for somebody else without uh, getting any recognition themselves. Just, make, just making the world a better place, that's all. Just making the world better. Lord, we ask you, invite you to help us in this. In the awesome and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, just a couple of announcements. Uh, again, uh, so tonight there will be no, I was told to announce this, no Bible for dumbbells tonight. We don't want half the room working out while the other half is um, celebrating.